Your sound system will be set to mute during the speaker sessions. You will be unmuted right after the speaker sessions. After that, you will be able to ask questions during the Q&A session. If you have any questions for the speakers during the speaker session, please post your questions in the chat windows at the bottom of the screen. You will try to answer your questions in the chat windows while the speaker is presenting. Alternatively, you can also ask your questions directly during the Q&A sessions. We will also have a few poll questions at the various points during this webinar. They will come on the screen when it happens. Please do take part in, in answering the poll. To continue with our main topics and without further ado, let me introduce the two speakers from Canary Labs. Sean Ebersole with seven years of experience at Canary Labs and Carl Kensinger, senior consultant at Canary Labs will be sharing their knowledge about the Canary Labs system, which is the time series database for industrial automation. Hello, Sean and Carl. Thank you for joining us today. I think we have a room full of enthusiastic people waiting to hear your presentations and demonstration of the technology. The uh, Canary Lab system is such a cool and valuable technology. In this webinar, there are two essentials that we will be addressing. The first one is what is the Canary Lab system? And secondly, why the Canary Lab system is the best choice for data analysis and or and management? Now I pass the floor to our speaker, Sean and Carl. Okay, thank you so much. We're very excited to be here and uh, tell everybody about the Canary system. So, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Terry. So I wanna welcome the engineers and data experts that have joined us today. And thank you for taking time to learn more about Canary. Uh, as I said, I'm very excited to speak to you about our software and explain how Canary can help you easily use your process data. At Canary, we know that engineers have very grand ideas of what they want to do with their data. They want to store everything at a high polling rate, make the data available to everybody in the organization who needs to access it, and finally interpret and act on the data, maximizing the potential of the operation. Basically, engineers and companies want to use their data. And the right tools can give you the power to transform your team, making it easy to use your process data, automating workflows within your organization, and ultimately unleashing your team of data rock stars. But there are huge problems preventing engineers and companies from effectively using their data Database management can make companies feel st stuck and frustrated. Continuing operations with a production mindset while balancing security is a challenge. Maximizing time series data with other solutions on the market is just way too expensive and the return on investment may not be realized for many years. With the Canary system, you can transform your operation. Canary provides the ability to collect and store vast amounts of process data, adds context to your data, making it more relevant, and finally gives your team easy to use tools and secure database access your organization needs. So welcome to the webinar, Future Approach of Successful Data Analysis and Management. As Jerry said, my name is Kyle Kensinger. I'm a solution consultant at Canary. And joining us for the live demo of our software will be Sean Ebersole. And Sean is a senior solution consultant at Canary. So today we're gonna to talk about how Canary can help you easily use your process data to make the right operational decisions. Canary has been around for over 35 years, and we've helped many engineers and organizations just like yours. The Canary system has been installed over 19,000 times in over 55 countries and more than 20 industries all over the globe. 
Canary works with companies of all shapes and sizes across many industries. Whether our customer has a very small or extremely large operation, every company we work with has the same core ideas of what they want to do with their process data. And companies trust Canary to guide them through the process. We guide our customers to success by following three steps. Step one, collect and store your data. Step two, assign context to your data. And step three, maximize your operation. And the first step we will discuss today is collecting and storing your data. Starting with Canary Collectors. Canary Collectors help you reach out to all industry standard protocols so you can log data directly from your process into our system. And collectors can include MQTT Spark Plug B, OPC UA or DA, SCADA systems, SQL databases, CSV files, and web and .NET APIs allow you to create your own custom collectors. A typical architecture would look something like this with your PLCs and devices out in the field. And you probably already have an OPC server or MQTT broker that your devices are speaking to. We would install our collector software on the OPC server. Then we would build out a Canary Historian server with the rest of our software, which the client tools will connect to. It is important to note the Canary Historian does not impact the PLCs or the devices, nor can it write records back through an OPC server or MQTT broker to those devices. The client tools have no way to impact the OPC server that access stops at the historian. Now let's talk about the store and forward technology. The Canary Collector will be installed local to your OPC server or MQTT broker machine, and we also install the sender service. The sender service will point across the network to the Canary Historian, where it is matched to a receiver service that is local to the Historian. The data is configured with the Canary Collector, the sender service pulls the data from the OPC server and then pushes it across the network to the receiver service. The receiver service checks it into the historian and communicates to the sender that the message was received and written to the database. If for any reason the network is not available, that's okay. All data will be cached locally the admin is notified that we are no longer receiving data into the historian from that logging instance. And when the network connection is available again, we will automatically backfill the data in real time. The system allows for dual logging and sending data from one sender to multiple receivers and historians. When we talk about collecting and storing data, it's all about the database. And this is where the Canary Historian really shines. The Canary Historian is a NoSQL time series database, specifically built for process data and industrial automation. It has been optimized for performance. And best of all, no database administration skills are required to maintain the historian. The historian is highly scalable, so whether you're tracking 100 tags or 2 million tags, it is the exact same software install. All that changes is the licensing. You can dual log and use historian mirror service to mirror data from one canary historian to another. And no matter how large your system gets, their performance remains constant and does not degrade over time. 
you can achieve over 1.5 million writes per second, and you can read over 2.5 million reads per second out of the historian. So what is a tag? A tag is a single stream of time series data, also referred to as points, channels, or items. And a tag consists of TVQ, timestamp, value, quality, and also metadata properties like engineering units, high-low set points, GPS coordinates. These are all fully customizable data properties. Once all the data is written to the historian, it's important to start thinking about how we will compress it in order to keep our data footprint as small as possible. Canary has developed a unique lossless compression algorithm with best-in-class performance, three times data compression. Because it's lossless, we are never interpolating data, never cutting data values. The unique raw values are stored every time. So in review, when talking about collecting and storing data, our Canary system is out of the box ready. Everything is pre-integrated in the system. Between store and forward technology and lossless compression, you never have to worry about data loss. And ultimately, Canary has created a database you can depend on. So that wraps up the first step. Um, I believe we now have some poll questions for you to take a look at and ponder. Okay, great job with the poll questions there. Let's see. All right, so number one, if the network connection is interrupted, data will not be collected until the network connection is restored. That is actually false. So we are going to go ahead and continue to collect data and it is the store and forward technology that allows us to continue to collect that data. And when the network connection is restored, it will be sent into the historian. Uh, for number two, what makes up a tag? Uh, nine of 11 are correct. Uh, Timestamp, value, quality, and also metadata properties. Great job. Step two is all about assigning context to your data. And a common problem we see many companies face is something like this. They have a piece of equipment, a site or a SCADA system with a tag naming structure that's being followed and written into the historian. But then somewhere else in the organization, there's another piece of equipment or site or SCADA system with a different set of tag names that's also being stored in the historian. Now, normally this does not impact production. Your operations are probably going to work just fine, even with different naming conventions. But it creates a problem when your engineers are trying to generate reports on the data and trend the data and learn from the data because they have to remember all of these different tag naming structures so imagine if you could leave the operation alone, not change the PLC, not change the SCADA system, but unify the namespace so that for reporting purposes, all tags follow the desired format. And the Canary system has given you the power to do just that. You can create virtual views of the data, influencing how the client can interact with the data without ever altering the data in its physical storage. When a client reads data from the historian, 
The view service is the filter that the client looks through to browse, retrieve tags, and read data from the historian. And by utilizing the view service, you can essentially change the way the client sees and interacts with the data inside the historian. You can reshape and alias a tag format inside the historian without changing the historical record. If you create multiple views of that historical record, then you can offer very specific security-based permissions to the client of how they see data inside the historian. So would the client see the data through filter one or filter two? Well, it depends on what data they need to view. And Canary has given the admin the power to control who can access the data based on the needs of the organization. This is accomplished through security permissions or Active Directory login. And the virtual views offers tremendous functionality. Login configurations to the views are fully customizable to fit the needs of the organization. So here's an example of how virtual views can assign context to your data. Inside the historian, you have these 10 pieces of IO and we apply a virtual view and now the client sees a unified naming space. Now let's switch over to 10 different pieces of IO on line two. The client still sees the same format, but the tags have retained their uniqueness. Notice when I go back to line number one. And back over to line two. The client sees the structured unified namespace, but the PLCs or devices don't need to be touched or altered in any way. The tags retain their uniqueness. So how do you create virtual views? Regular expressions give you the ability to restructure tag names while maintaining tag uniqueness. If your tag names don't have as much logic as you would like, that can be supplemented through reading a CSV file or SQL database. What else can be done with virtual views? Once tags have been restructured and a unified namespace has been established, you can create custom asset models to further empower your team and turn them into data rock stars. And your organization is likely already talking about your equipment from an asset viewpoint. So if you had a site with three lines and those lines are made up of boilers and fillers and water mains, it might look something like this. And notice line two has two fillers and line three has two boilers. So how would virtual views capture all of these assets? Well, we have the unified namespace for the tags. And notice in this particular namespace, the second branch of the tag name tells us what the piece of equipment is and the instance or count of the equipment. So you see line one has a boiler with three tags, a filler with five tags, and a water main with two tags. You can use virtual views to create common tag names and group them into assets. So looking back at the site example, we have the four boilers, one on line one, one on line two, and two on line three. So let's see how virtual views would handle this particular asset. Using the unified namespace model that we've built out, you see line one, boiler one, and then the three common asset tag names. And the same with each of the other boilers on the other lines. Common tag names with unique identifiers show you exactly where the asset is and what else it impacts. So what is the benefit? Well, beyond giving you better organization, it gives your team the ability to make specific requests based on asset types. For example, you can say, show all boiler temperature tags. 
Or more specifically, it helps automation experts automate their workflow. Filtering based on asset tag conditions means you can immediately see all boilers with a temperature that's outside of a desired range. There is power in the ability to automate workflow and easily use your process data. You no longer need to hunt for information, but can instead quickly generate reports with the information that you need. It is key to point out that models will not break if the assets don't match up perfectly. And if you have a dynamic process where you're constantly bringing assets online or offline, the virtual views looks for tags to be dropped out of the historian and it updates your model automatically. So now that you've been introduced to virtual views, let's look at another way Canary can assign context to your data. And the next piece of software in the system is the calculation engine. If you think about it, your car's dashboard is feeding you raw process data, like how fast you're going, how many miles are on the odometer, and how much fuel is left in the tank. That's all raw data. Additionally, if you have a check engine light coming on, you're looking at condition-based data. And many cars today have an indicator of range or how many miles you can drive at your current fuel level. That's running some type of calculation to estimate the KPI. If we look at these different types of data, traditionally in the historian, all we have is raw data. But if we have these raw data tags and group them into assets, we can create other calculated tags of condition-based rules and calculated KPIs. The calculation engine is powerful you can deploy a single calculation to all instances of an asset type. It runs in real time while also backfilling, and more than 70 functions are available. If we look at the asset tags of a boiler, we can see there's a temperature tag, and every five seconds or one second, it's pooling to get a new temperature. We could run a calculation anytime there's a boiler ask it to use the temperature tag and give us an average 60 minute temperature for the tag. Or for a filler, we could use the out bottle count and out bottles rejected to determine the percentage of rejected bottles. And just like you can do condition-based tag calculations, you can also key off those calculations to monitor asset health you can create a series of logic or rules to determine whether an asset is in an alert state or not. Then you can do reporting and pull analytics based around the events. Event monitoring provides condition-based asset monitoring, reporting based on event performance, and analytics surrounding the event durations. So a simple rule would be to trigger an event if the level of a tank gets below 25% and the temperature of the liquid gets below 80 degrees. So we did this with simulation data and here's what we got back. You see a list of instances of events within the conditions that we've structured at various sites. Notice you get the source, the start and end time, the duration, and analytic properties associated with the event. All this information is customizable and can be tailored to your needs. So that wraps up the second step. And before we move on to our third and final step, let's toss out another series of poll questions.
Okay. For question number one, virtual views are created using regular expressions to restructure tag names while maintaining tag uniqueness. That is true. And calculations can only be deployed to a single instance. Right. It's false. It can be deployed to many instances of uh, an asset type. So great job. Okay, so step three is where we examine different pieces of software that are client facing. Starting with Axiom, Axiom is our trending dashboarding and reporting tool. It's built with HTML, so it works with any modern web browser, and it is designed for self-serve reporting. Axiom changes the traditional model of the client asking the SCADA team to produce a trend chart and makes it easy for the end user to produce their own trend charts. Here are a few examples of charts that have been produced in Axiom. And you see it's easy to incorporate trend charts and tables of data. And you can also add things like donut gauges or spark lines. Axiom can be used to build applications that are less about trend lines and more about looking at data tables or graphs. Axiom is a blank slate that allows you to customize and build out whatever it is you need to visualize. And you'll see this in Sean's live demo in just a few moments. The Excel add-in is another great tool in the Canary system. We know that many members of your team are already using Excel and the add-in allows you to connect your Canary data to Excel. This helps quickly solve reporting needs and gets raw and aggregated process data out of the historian and back to your customers. And it also gives you the ability to build event monitoring on the fly. The Canary system makes it easy to get data out of the historian and into other systems and pieces of software. And that is where the Canary connectors help. And connectors can include Publish Service, Web API, MQTT Publishing Client, SCADA connectors, an ODBC connector if you need to expose the Canary historian in a SQL-like manner to make queries against our database. And OPC HDA server speaks directly to our historian. So that wraps up the three steps of how we can help get you unstuck on your journey to digital transformation. And just to recap, the Canary system includes everything we've already discussed. It's all prepackaged and integrated in the system. The only thing we license are the number of tags for the Canary historian and the user license for the client tools, which are Axiom and the Excel add-in. So now we will kick off our live demo and Sean will show you just how easy it is to use. Well, thank you, Kyle. That was a great presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with everybody. Okay. Hopefully. Looks good, Sean. That's green. Good, thank you, Kyle. Okay, well, as Kyle mentioned, uh, my name is Sean Ebersole, and I want to take you guys through a quick tour of our some of our uh, client tools. Uh, what you're looking at right now is uh, Axiom, and as Kyle mentioned, this is our main dashboarding, trending, reporting tool. And uh, I just have a quick example of a screen that you know, maybe an end user, such as an operator or an engineer, might be looking at. Um, you know, Axiom is browser-based, uh, so the great thing is uh, anybody can access the data from any device by simply opening a modern web browser and entering in the, the DNS or the URL address for the application that they want to look at. Um, so what we're looking at here is a very simple uh, grid type of report. Uh, I can see I have my temperature and flow. I can look and see a seven day average. I can see what the max was over a seven day period. Uh, here's the minimum during that same time frame, And then finally, what was the range? So a real, real quick example of, a, of a, a grid type of report. I could also 
show live values updating uh, in real time as well on that type of a, a, of a control on the screen. Uh, this would be a very basic trend chart. I'm just looking at two different tags in real time. And um, we're going to talk a little more about that in a second. And down here would be an example, uh, as Kyle mentioned, virtual views. Um, you know, I have uh, different boilers. I have an asset model created. Uh, so if I would like to look at maybe a different boiler on, say, line three, for example, it'll automatically update the, the panel here, and I can see the, the related controls uh, for that, that individual boiler. Um, so we have different types of gauges and, and other kinds of controls you'll see here in a minute. We'll actually build out one of these so you can see how easy it is. Um, and then here would be an example of an iframe, for example, if you know, maybe I wanted to look at the current weather uh, in a, in a, you know, from a particular website or I wanted to see a live camera feed. Uh, these are types of things that we can include in an iframe. So this, we're going to come back to this. We're going to build out a screen. Uh, but just to show you how easy it is, I'm going to actually kind of play two different roles here with you guys today. Uh, first, I want to switch over and play the role of the system administrator. Uh, I'd like to show you how we can actually collect some data. Kyle had mentioned in his presentation different ways that we collect data. So I'm just going to pick one, and, and we don't have time to go through them all, but let's say we wanted to collect data via an OPC, OPC UA server. Uh, so this is the main Canary administrator. Each of these tiles uh, it represents a different part of the system that we'd be administering. Uh, but where you see OPC collector, I'm going to come in and I'm going to configure a logging session. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll actually uh, just uh, say new session. And down here, I just need to configure uh, where I'm going to actually uh, log the data that I'm co connect, uh, collecting from the OPC server. So the first thing I need to do is determine where that data is going to go. Now, in this case, if I wanted to create a new data set, these are just uh, subfolders of, uh, of tag information. Uh, I can actually go into the historian tile, and these are my existing data sets you just saw in that dropdown. But there's a configuration page I can go to and simply create a new data set. I'll just call this one in Vigor Energy in honor of today's demo. And we'll create that as a data set. And maybe I'd also like to receive an email, for example, if maybe I don't receive any data in, you know, say, five minutes. Um, so I can go ahead and, uh, and apply that. So I have my data set created. And I can go back now, and I can actually select that data set from my list. We're just going to refresh this. Actually, I'm going to start from the very beginning here, create the new session. And we're going to actually now be able to pick our Invigor Energy data set. So now I need to configure uh, my OPC collector to the actual source of the data, our OPC server. So I need to point it to a, a host uh, or name or URL. I, ha I happen to have a server here in my office. And then I just need to put in the port number. And I can go ahead and apply that. So now what I can do is simply browse that OPC server and I'll see all the different nodes. So I know one particular node I want to go to that has different simulated examples. So we'll look, we'll actually collect some data from an oil well. Uh, maybe I'd just like to simply choose, uh, you know, these uh, nine tags here. And we'll go ahead and say, okay. So now I've created my tag list and I can apply that. So now I'm all set to start logging data uh, from these tags into the historian. So now that I've created that, um, I can actually, you know, come in further in, inside the group. If I wanted to, you know, re have multiple groups uh, that maybe log data at different rates, I can do that. I'm just going to stick with one group logging one second data at the moment. Okay. So we'll go ahead back to the main page, and I'll just simply hit the play button. And now we're logging data. So if I go back to my historian, back to the database, I can see here we have the Invigor Energy data set. We have nine tags being written. And I can actually come in and I can see right away, here's the very first file being stored in that data set. Here's the nine tags I selected. I can highlight any one of these tags and here's the values that we're starting to log. As Kyle mentioned, we store everything as a timestamp of value and equality. So really my job as a system admin is now complete. I've actually configured our Canary collector uh, and now we can go ahead from here and go back into Axiom and I can 
kind of take on the role as, a, say, an operator or engineer, and I want to analyze the data now that we're collecting. So that brings me back to Axiom. Now, what I'm going to do from here, I'm actually going to create a brand new application. Uh, there's always a menu at the very top left, and I can create a new chart or a new application. I'll start with a new application. So what this will allow me to do is I'll have basically a blank canvas, and from here I can start designing by dragging any of the controls over into the canvas. Now, the nice thing about designing an Axiom dashboard is that you can decide what size of screen will this application be used on. Maybe I want to create an application that will be used out in the field on a device, just maybe a simple iPhone or an iPad. I can adjust the screen size based on the pixel width and height of the actual device. Now, in my case for this screen, I, I, I know what size screen I have. I know that a good width is 1870 and, and a good uh, height is 1080 here. Okay. And now that I have my canvas all set, now I can start adding controls. So let's start with a basic trend graph. Okay, so here's all my controls. I can just drag and drop in the trend graph control right on the screen anywhere I want to. And then I can move it around on the screen. And maybe I'd like to kind of put it here in the center, maybe stretch it across here a little bit, um, and keep it about this, this width and height. And I can do one of two things. I can add trends or I can open a chart. So once we create a chart, we can save it. And then that can be referenced for future use. I'll just start from the beginning here and we'll add a trend to the chart. So this allows me to browse my data historian you know, where we were actually storing the data. So if you recall, uh, here is our Invigor Energy data set, for example. And here are those nine tags that we've been logging data to for the past minute or two. So I could select maybe these three particular, uh, or maybe these four uh, tags that were monitoring barrels per day of oil production. You know, I could just simply say add and close. And it will go ahead and will add those tags in my trend chart. Now, by default, I like my trend charts to show an hour's worth of data. Well, obviously, we just started logging the data, so I only have a couple minutes. So maybe I'll adjust the time span uh, to something like you know, maybe five minutes for the moment here. And so you can see here is the data. And I can hit the play button, and I'm actually trending live data on my trend chart right now at the moment. Now, that may be all I need, and I can say, hey, you know what? I've created my trend, tr trend chart. And I can go ahead and save it for future use or... Maybe there's some other things I'd like to do because actually with the trending tool, it's more than just trending live data. There's a lot of analytics that we can do within our trend tool. Um, but what I'd like to do is I'm going to actually pick a couple tags I have some data on, historical data that you know, we can work with. So I just want to uh, go ahead and uh, we're going to remove those tags and I'm going to add uh, some other tags here uh, very quickly. I'm actually going to go into this data set and I'm going to pick these four tags here, for example. So now I actually have tags with a lot of data, a lot of historical data. So it's very easy to navigate historically. Um, so for example, I'll just pause my trending screen here. Maybe I want to look at data over the past 24 hours. So I can just come in here and actually put one day in there. Not, yeah, cancel that. And we'll put one day for 24 hours. Um, and I just lost my trend graph. How about that? So we'll add our trends. Take these four in here. Add and close. So there's our four trends. And I'm going to go ahead and say I want to look at the data for 24 hours or one day. So there we can see we have the data uh, as soon as it will load here. Put that back in live mode. There we go. So I'm logging data for the past 24 hours. And I think I lost connection to my OPC server there. So let me go back and actually get rid of this trend chart. You got to love live demos. Everything works great until I start showing you how to do it. So, <laughs> um, let me back up here and, and start again. So I'm going to come back in here and pick, I'll pick my tags. There we go. Now, now we're going to say one day of data. There we go. So I'm looking at 24 hours of data right now. Actually, this is one second update. So that 
between the three tags there, there's what, 86,400 seconds in a day. So I just take that times three. That's how many TV queues of data I've just trended on that chart. Now you got to keep in mind that, um, you know, I think that comes out to be, you know, say 250,000 tr- uh, different data points. Well, there's only so many pixels on my screen, so it has to average out those pixels. And so you can, it does a calculation very quickly. It queries the data very quickly. Um, maybe I would like to look at a particular point in time. I can quickly zoom. I have a zoom control. I can come in and zoom in and look at the data um, at a closer level. So there I'm down to about three and a half hours of data. Maybe I see there was a problem and I'd like to put an annotation on my chart so I could come right here and say, you know what, I want to put an annotation right there. Maybe we recalibrated uh, the sensor. So it'll store that annotation in the historian. Um, you know, you can see there we have a little uh, a bubble that'll allow me to read that. Future users can come in and read that and even when they're signed then be able to add their own notes and keep a log of the data or of the, of the annotations. Um, we can do some, uh, some nice things as well. I'll make this a little bigger for the moment here. I could maybe band uh, two trends together very quickly so I can keep them on the same x-axis if I'd like to. Um, or maybe I just kind of want to drag and move them around on the screen a little bit and overlay them. So it's really easy to, uh, to analyze trends by layer, layering them over top of one another. Uh, for example, I'm looking at live data on three trends but maybe uh, my, tr- my first trend here, I'd really like to compare that to how that trend was performing, say, two weeks ago when this particular unit came out of service when it was running optimally. Well, I can simply come back in and I could add maybe that same trend again. So I've added uh, the same two trends and I actually just move those at the very top. So the top two trends, the gray and the red are the same trend. But I can go into my editing properties and I can apply a time shift to that, for example. So I can say, you know what, I want to look at the data maybe, maybe from, you know, 12 hours ago, let's say. So I can go ahead. Now I've banded, or I should say I've time shifted the data 24 hours ago. Um, maybe I'll even want to zoom in here to a closer range and compare it. So I can see, you know, how that data was performing. Um, in this case, um, here was just a quick seven minute segment, but I could see you know how it was running twelve hours ago compared to now, for example. Now there's not much of a difference here, but you know over time equipment may start to have some maintenance issues, and we need to make sure that we're comparing optimal running performance with what, how it's currently running. So that's a common use when you want to look at time shifting data. Uh, a couple things real quick, and then we'll complete our dashboard. Um, I'd like to come into the the blue trend here, and I'd like to make sure that I know if it's coming close to maybe a particular uh, limit. Let's say I wanna know whenever the value, if it gets to 800, I'd like to see some type of a, maybe a dashed line. uh, So you can see how I can make sure how close I'm running to an undesired threshold. And I can take that a step further. Um, You know, I could say, you know what, I also want to make sure that the, uh, when it's above uh, 800, I would also like the trend itself to change color and fill in. So what I've done here is now I've kind of, I put a limit uh, on that trend chart. Now on the back end of the system, you know, we can also send out alert messages that when this trend hits that threshold, it'll send an email or a text message to the operator or the engineer that this particular piece of equipment is having an issue. And we'll be able to run event reports later on as well. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot we can do in the trending tool itself. And I know we'll talk more about this at the end, but there's a great, online academy we have that teaches you all about our trend chart and we'll make sure we provide those details to you. But I'm going to go ahead for the moment. I will save this. The great thing is I can save this trend chart under a public folder, uh, private just for my use when I sign in or read only, meaning that as an administrator, I want to make sure everyone has access to the chart, but I don't want people to make any changes to it. Uh, So I'm going to go ahead and just call this in, in vigor energy is the trend chart I want to save that to in the public folder. So I've saved this chart. It's, it's, it's good to go. Anybody that wants to access it can, but I'm going to include it in my dashboard I'm designing here. So I have my trend chart ready. Now let's say I'd like to put in uh, a grid, maybe to have some type of some um, uh, KPIs updating and, and a grid type of control. So I can just drag in a grid, drop it in, 
and maybe I'd like the size of the grid about the same as uh, the chart here. And I'm going to just uh, move that up a little bit. And I'm going to put a couple rows of information here. Uh, maybe first off, I'd like to drop in uh, a label. Um, and then also with, um, with my grid, I'd like to make the grid maybe four columns wide. Okay. And so once I have the label here, I'm actually going to copy and paste that across because I'm going to label my columns. And then I'm going to do one more label here. This first one I'm actually just going to delete out because I don't want a label over top of my, uh, my rows. But this label here, I'm going to just call it uh, you know, live data, for example. Uh, this will be 30-minute um, uh, average data. And this will be 24-hour max, for example. So what we're going to do then here, I'm going to come in, I'm going to call this particular label um, temperature, or just temp for short. And you know what, I don't need that much space, that much width just for my label, so I can come down and adjust my column widths. I'm just going to say, you know what, I only need about 10% of, of the grid width for that column for temperature. And then what I want to do from here is I'm going to take a value box, drag and drop that in, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and with the value box itself, I, I have different properties. So the first thing I want to do is I want to link uh, this value box to an actual temperature tag. So maybe in this case, I want to come into uh, this particular boiler, let's say, and I want to apply the temperature tag. All right. And then I would then from here want to take the same tag. I'm just going to do a copy and paste. So now for my 30 minute average column, I'd like to simply come in and say, you know what, I want to say my start time, I want to go now minus 30 M for 30 minutes. And starting back 30 minutes ago up to the most previous 30 minutes, I want to apply a data aggregate. We have over 40 ways to aggregate the data. And in this case, I just want to look for a simple time average to aggregate and apply that. So it's automatically updated. And then I'm going to copy and paste that here. So for my 24 hour max, uh, I'm going to say now minus 24H for 24 hours. And then I want to take the leading 24 hours and I would like to apply the maximum uh, aggregate to that. So let's just find the maximum two and apply that. Okay. And um, so what I can do here as well, just to kind of clean this up, I could, you know, highlight those three and then I can come in to my horizontal alignment and say I want to center that. So now I have one row with my, uh, and actually they're going to do the same thing with my labels. I've got to keep this neat for everybody. We're going to make this uh, centered. And then I'm going to do one more uh, row here. I'm going to go back to my controls and drag in uh, one more label. And we're going to call this uh, pressure. Okay. And then I'm going to take value boxes again. And for the first value box, we're going to just go in here and assign it to the pressure tag. So there's my live data. We'll copy and paste that one. So for this one, the same idea. We're just going to simply say now minus 30 M. And the value will be 30 M. I'm sorry for the inter interval. And then we're going to come in and do the time average again. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and do minus 24 hours for the final one for the 24 hour max. And we're going to go ahead to the max two aggregate. So there I've kind of, and I'll just clean this up again. I'm going to center my columns here again. So we're going to go with the horizontal alignment be center. And I can just kind of move that up there to make that look nice and neat. So I have a, I have a grid control. I have a trend chart. And I'm just going to do one, one final one here for us. I'm going to create a uh, – I'm going to actually add in a panel at the bottom here. So the panel is nice because the panel is almost like a, a subdivision of the screen itself. I can apply properties that pertain only to this panel. And uh, I'm actually going to just shrink up our trend graph here a little bit so I have more room for my panel. Okay, we'll just make the panel about that size there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in, first of all, I'm going to assign this to an asset model. So the great thing is I have a boiler asset model using our virtual views. 
and I want to default it. I have seven different boilers uh, in my virtual view, and I just want to default to the very first boiler. Okay, and then what happens from here is I can go ahead and say, you know what, uh, whenever I want to choose between different boilers, uh, I'd like to put this in a, more of an inline type of picker. So it already recognizes all, all seven of my boilers. I'll make that about uh, a width of 200 so I have more space on my panel. And then I can start adding in other, other items into my panel. Let's just say I just want to do a couple donut gauges very quickly. Uh, so maybe I'd like to make one donut gauge for um, uh, the pressure again. So let's go back to the pressure. Okay. And now with, with a, a donut gauge, I have different properties. So I probably want to adjust my high scale since you can see we're already pretty high there. You know, maybe I want to, I know that the pressure could get up to 2000 PSI. So I'll just make the high scale 2000. So you can kind of see where we're at in correlation to the max uh, for that gauge. Uh, we can set limits. I could say, you know what, if the value gets above, uh, say 1100, uh, then I want, uh, you know, the color to be you know, red, for example. Okay. So I can kind of see where I'm at, or I could even say, you know what, don't show the limit, just change the color when it does get above 1100. So now we're in the red for this particular gauge. And I can just do a copy and paste and maybe for the next gauge, um, I want to come in to the source tag and say, you know what, we want to monitor temperature. Okay, so now I can kind of change uh, my scaling as well here for the property. So instead of 2000, like it was for the other one, I'll say, you know what, 400 is the max it's ever going to get temperature wise. Okay, so I know we're running short on time, but what I want to do is I want to go ahead, I'm going to actually save this. So we saved the chart, but I want to actually save the application in a public folder, um, which I already um, I had one earlier here. I'm going to actually call this one Invigor Energy 2 and save that. So once it's saved, now I can put this in live mode and now I have a complete, sort of complete <laughs> dashboard. Um, now, if I wanted to open up the one I started with, I can come back and open up the original Invigor Energy, which I completed before you know, the webinar here, I had a little bit more time, uh, but you can kind of see then how that looks as a completed type of application. Now there's many more ways to do this in examples. And again, you know, we have some other online resources you can go go check out afterwards. Um, but one final thing, um, we have automated reports in Axiom. So I could go into my menu and go into my reports. And uh, oops, let me skip that. And I could say, you know what, I want to create a scheduled report. So I could say, hey, you know what, I really think this would, if I designed this correctly, where it would actually just pull on averages and mins and maxes for a period of time, um, I could say, this is my report. And then I could come in and schedule on a weekly, monthly, on an advanced type of uh, setting, or I can even have a report generated when an event that's in progress, say like that high temperature event that I said that we could set up in the back end. But what I can actually do is say, when that event completes, generate the report. But I'll just say, you know what, on Mondays uh, at, uh, let's just say, 0600 hours, um, I want this report to generate and then I want it to be emailed to this person. We'll just use my email address. I've used it before and I can add that. So now at 6 a.m. on Monday, this report, that application, it'll take a snapshot of that and email it to me. Um, so that this is a very quick overview. Hopefully you can see the ease of use in the system, how easy it is to configure uh, the system to start logging data and then how you can create trends and applications and reports from the data within the historian. Uh, so I think uh, we do have a, you know, a, a question we wanted to pull up uh, on the screen here for our final poll for the audience. Uh, thank you, Sean, for your presentation. Um, now, I think, Yuri, would you be able to uh, moderate the Q&As from our audience? Please? You have to unmute your mic, Yuri. 
All right, thank you, Vaseline. Uh, thank you, Sean, and thank you, Carl. Um, I think, um, Vaseline, there should be another poll just before uh, Sean ends his uh, presentations. Uh, I wonder if you can just uh, fire up the poll, please. Uh, I think Sean, you have to stop sharing, Sean. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, hi, Vaseline. Do you have the poll? Otherwise, we can move on to the Q&A sessions. Ah, oh, right. Okay, we can see it now. Yeah. Okay, here's the results. Uh, so our first question, Axiom can do the following. And majority of the audience said all of the above. That is correct. Axiom can trend data, display dashboards, and automate reports. And then our last question, uh, true or false, Axiom displays data that is stored in the Canary Historian. And most everyone was correct. That is true. Absolutely. That's where Axiom pulls the data into our displays. All right. Very good. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you, Carl. Um, let us open the uh, the floor to uh, Q and A uh, sessions. Um, I've got a few questions that was registered in the uh, in the chat window. So let me just read them out. Um, there are quite a few questions that is relating to how um, the Canary Lab system is compared to the competitors like Pi, Process Book. Um, in particular, there was one that is making um, asking whether. Uh, what would be the comparison between the two in our products? And the other one is, uh, what is the, um, what are the features that Axions can do that the Pi process book cannot do? Sure, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer that, Thierry, because uh, that's a very common question. Um, obviously, OSI Soft Pi uh, is a great system, and uh, Canary, um, I guess what we find is because we have a lot of global partners. As Kyle mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, we're in over 55 countries, and we get a lot of feedback that, you know, the people that use Pi and they use Canary in different projects, they really like the ease of use. As you saw how easy I could configure a logging session. Um, now, I didn't actually show you how easy it was to install, but the installation takes five minutes. Uh, and once it's installed, then we can configure quickly, we can build screens quickly and easily. Um, and that, that's kind of where I would say one of our strongest points are versus Pi, for example. Uh, Pi is, it, it's a big system. It takes a long time to implement and get up and running. Um, another, another thing is cost. Um, you know, we're a very uh, competitively priced system. Uh, it, we're, we're much less in cost. I even hate to say that because I don't want us to sound like we have some type of a cheaper software uh, it's a very robust software, um, and we have some incredible technology on the back end um, as well. Uh, but you know, we yeah you know, we have a, a couple uh, big big uh, selling points when we have customers that want to buy Pi or want to buy Canary. They're not sure. You know, that's where we can kind of you know you know excel when it comes to that. Yeah, Sean, another key point I think that's important to point out is that we never interpolate data. We never cut the data values. We're able to store the raw values each and every time in the historian. Yeah, that's an important feature as well. Uh, even uh, Pi, they do have to interpolate some data. And so, you know, we have all the data stored in its original format. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, I think uh, during the uh, the chat uh, when you were presenting, I think there was a message that came across quite strongly. I think a lot of the users find that um, the uh, the system is actually quite user friendly. They see how you know when you you know demonstrating how to make the charts and how to configure things. I think 
um, that itself is quite flexible. It's, I think in, in some way it's quite powerful. So that could be another strength of the, uh, the ASEAN system. Um, okay, so there is another question that also making comparisons uh, between uh, Canary and Microsoft Azure, the SQL database. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and again, like when we talk about uh, Microsoft Azure, I mean that's a, also a cloud platform, um, and actually Canary can be installed locally on any anything from a just a, a, a Windows PC to a server grade machine, uh, and that can also be hosted. Um, Canary, you know, we have customers that actually host Canary in an Azure environment or AWS. Um, you know, actually, that's what we use internally is AWS for our hosting. Um, and in terms of like a, a SQL database with Microsoft Azure, you know, when we talk about, you know, SQL, and Kyle kind of alluded to it, like with, with SQL, um, you're going to have to do a lot of tuning to the database as it grows in size. You're going to have to, you know, do a lot of indexing and, um, you know, you, you, even our data archiving, uh, so when it comes time to compare historical data with real-time data, um, you know, you may have one second data resolution, but then it has to be averaged out over time. So you're missing that true granularity of the original data. Uh, so maybe there was a quick uh, event that happened over a second or, or five seconds. Well, you're going to lose that event over time in a SQL database. Uh, we keep that same raw data and store that and we use lossless compression. So we were able to store years of data in the same uh, format that it was originally stored in on the same hard drive and have that quickly available. Okay, that is good. Um, there is another question that I think that is related to about data collections. Um, the question is for data collection, is it only able to store at the time you start a new collection? Is there any way of collecting data prior to that? Yeah, yeah. and then that's quite common because uh, we'll come into a situation where a customer may have years of data that they've already stored from a different system, for example. Um, so, you know, it's quite common that we'll do, we'll start logging data uh, for in our system in day one, but then we'll take and migrate that historical data and, bas and basically we just stitch it together uh, with, with the live data so that there's a continuous data structure. Um, you know, we have tools, you know, different migration tools to do that. Now, if we're talking SQL, you know, we have a SQL collector that works great, very easy to migrate in historical data from a SQL database into our system. Um, but yeah, we, we do that, you know, quite often. That, that's, um, that's a common thing we do is migrate data. Okay, very good. Um, there is another question, uh, which is on whether Excel does its own QAQC check. Which one was that, Terry? I'm sorry. Um, the question on does Excel oh, okay, has its own data QAQC check. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, our, our system, you know, we actually validate the data continually. It runs in the background. Uh, so we're always validating the data inside the historian. Um, and you know, if, if there's any type of, um, uh, you know, when, and when you want to, you know, review data, you have the option to even include in the reporting in Axiom or in the Excel add-in, you can look for data that had a bad data quality and pull that mm -hmm. out and do a report. Uh, so it, it, it functions quite well when you're looking for maybe some problems with the data itself, not even, you know, a piece of equipment, so to speak. Yeah. I, I recall early on um, in the presentation, so you mentioned, I think it was Carl mentioned that, you know, uh, one of the uh, big key uh, features of the uh, actions is that you're able to put in condition-based uh, kind of uh, features on the data. So I guess, you know, um, this can very well be used on some of the client's data if they know the certain condition that they, that, you know, that they think is, uh, is the quality for bad data. That is, it would be quite a big QAQC check, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's correct. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've just got another question. So I think it's the last question that we uh, recorded during the Q and A. Sorry, during the speaker sessions. Um, um, it was uh, one of the uh, the audience uh, who could join quite late, uh, not too late, but uh, so he missed some sections of Kyle's presentation. So he was asking about the uh, canary connections. The, uh, 
connections or the connector for the data. So he was asking, you know, uh, what is the functions? Okay, so like our different types of collect uh, collectors. So, um, you know, we, you know, the the one that I kind of showed in the live demo was an OPC UA uh, collector we have, but we have the ability to collect DA. Uh, we have a, uh, a what we call actually our data logger for classic DA. And then we can collect data. For, uh, we have a, you know, different SQL collectors. Uh, we actually have a CSV uh, a collector that'll pull in a CSV file. It'll just kind of watch a, a directory, and every time there's a new file that's dropped in, it'll uh, it'll assimilate that right into the historian. Uh, we have our MQTT collector. Um, you know, we have a, a .NET and Web API, so we can you know write custom applications, uh, get the data from those into our our software. Uh, yeah, so there's the, and then there's the other, you know, SCADA connectors we have uh, that will collect data directly from the SCADA system. So there's numerous ways to get the data into our historian. Okay, excellent. Um, so I think with that, we should be able to open the, uh, the Q&A to the floor now. I think I've just seen someone has raised his hand and, and you know, quite eager to ask questions. So I'm going to let uh, Amil um, ask the questions. Hi, hello. Hello. Hi, Amil. Can everyone hear me? I hope my mic is clear. Oh, yes. Very yes. clear, actually. Oh, that's great. Um, okay, thank you, Kyle, Theory, and Sean for the presentation. I have a few questions here. I have a whiteboard behind me, so I have four. But <laughs> I think I'll, 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 I'll ask one question because that's kind of theoretical. And then the other three is regarding the dashboard. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so the first question is, uh, since this software is like browser based, how is the security of our data when using this software? Yeah, we, we have uh, uh, data encryption, uh, both uh, in the database itself, all the files are encrypted. And then it also, you know, so it's encrypted at rest and then it's encrypted uh, through our, our view service. So. Yeah, and I don't know if you saw in Kyle's presentation, uh, we have our, our views layer. So when Axiom uh, requests the data from the historian, it has to authenticate at the views level. Um, we're taking the Active Directory credentials of the each end user, and then there's actual more uh, security layers in there that we can add per user. Uh, so we can restrict what data maybe a particular user can access versus another user or group of individuals. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we, we do, we do, uh, I mean, cause I guess we have, we have some pretty, um, I, I don't want to say top secret, but yet it sort of is like, uh, customers that rely on our data to be very secure. Like the United States Navy, for example, uh, they use us on different nuclear vessels. Oh, the Navy uh, uses it. Yeah. The United States Navy. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're in their two of their nuclear vessels, the Virginia class nuclear subs and the Nimitz class aircraft carriers. Um, Oof. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Navy's used us for, I don't know, like 15 or 20 years. Long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, long time. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, okay, that clears up my, my suspicion regarding security, thank you. So now, dashboard. Mm -hmm. What browser were you using? I was using Chrome. Uh, any, gotcha. any modern web browser though will work fine. Um, so, okay. There was one part in the dashboard. Um, I saw you were putting tags into the, you were choosing your parameters, uh, tags, I think they were called, and then you were yeah. putting into the dashboard, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. I was wondering, is it possible to group the tags, for example, like well one, and then there's like five tags and then well two, five tags. Can you group the tags? Yeah. So, um, and what I didn't get to show is there's there's a there's different ways. See, what we do is we use our virtual views. So um, when we say, okay, I want to um, add in a tag, say a pressure for that boiler. Mm -hmm. Well, we have an, we have a template that allows you to say say I like in my example, I think I only had seven boilers, but and that, and we can even make sure we send you. There's a video of this, but 
uh, we can auto discover as that new assets connect in because uh, we're using for, uh, regex rules. So when that tag stream starts streaming in new data, that regex rule says, oh, okay, you're a, you're a boiler. Oh, you're the pressure for that boiler. We'll put you here. And then when I'm creating my dashboard, I can see all pressures all together at once just by Whoa. adding one tag into the dashboard. That was one feature I just didn't have time to show, um, but you know we definitely actually recorded a couple cool uh, YouTube videos showing those examples. So you, you do one click and it can account for a multitude of all the tags associated with you know that asset. Um, so the capability. I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to see that. Yeah. 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 So maybe. Uh, Terry, we can make sure we connect you with those videos, uh, links, a uh, couple YouTube videos we have that mm -hmm. demonstrates that. All right. Okay. Last yeah. question. Last question. Okay. Yeah. In, in the dashboard, when you put the graph, right, I think you put a range of three hours. I can't remember what it was, but can you press control alt and then zoom your mouse scroll in and out? So like you can see zoom in and zoom out in the dashboard. So you're saying the control alt, um, mouse scroll. Yeah, um, yeah. So you can you can scroll. Um, there's um, I don't want to put it, there there are, there are two little like fast forward rewind buttons that you can click and it'll just start scrolling back. And there's a playback as well. I can go to a point in time and just play it back in, in any any particular rate. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, the the scroll yeah so if i scroll backward I'm, I'm just holding down like a rewind and it'll just do that scroll it doesn't actually do the control alt but i just see press the button uh, to scroll back okay thank you that's all mm -hmm. thank you sure good questions thank you thank you amir you're welcome so i would like to open the floor to other uh, audience um so if you want to ask a question please raise your hand uh, in the uh in the bar on the right. So it looks like we haven't got any more questions uh, from the floor. Um, maybe we can just give another three minutes before we end the sessions. And, and Terry, I think I could even put in the chat uh, the link to that video that I was, uh, two videos I was talking about. So I'll go oh, ahead. Okay, and that is great, yeah. Put that in the, in the chat. So let me get down here to make sure it goes to everybody. So there's uh, the first link to the first video that'll show uh, how we ought to discover the assets. And then I have one more. To our axiom display. Okay. Put that one in here. Okay. But yeah, I just, the two links uh, that I was mentioning to Amir, Terry, I just put in the chat uh, for anybody that would like to copy those into. Uh, you're, you're welcome, Farah. And I alluded to this too, Thierry. Uh, the we have an online university, uh, so like some of the features I just didn't have time to show. Um, uh, they can go to learn.canarylabs.com. I just put that in the chat as well, and it's a free online training academy. So anybody doesn't have to be a customer. You know, they could enroll and start taking the courses on. You know, we have several different courses on Axiom trending and then dashboarding. Uh, and we didn't really get into our Excel add-in tool, uh, but there's a whole uh, a series of courses on that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think, thank you, uh, Sean. So I think we'll make sure that we send um, the, the links and, and also the, uh, the links to the, uh, the academies uh, when we send out a lot of questions, uh, sorry, for our emails after this uh, webinar. Um, so I haven't seen any more questions, so I, I think we should be ending this session so quite uh, right now, um, so let me just uh, let me just do that. Um, so yes, uh, thank you, Sean, and thank you, Carl, and very appreciate your time today. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, um, we'll be ending this webinar now. 
uh, what will happen after this, it will be sending out follow-up emails uh, with the link to the recording of this uh, webinar. So you will be able to review the material if you manage to, uh, if you so, you know, if you came in late and, and miss some of the material, so you'll be able to play by and listen the, uh, to the recording uh, once again. And uh, also right after this uh, webinar, there will be a, a, a questionnaire and please do uh, take your time to up the questionnaire that will give very good feedback to us on the uh, your, your experience of this webinar today and also um, you know giving us you know the pointers to improve our future webinars uh, I think we have a very good experience today so I think you know we're looking forward to do more webinar with Sean and Carl in the futures um, okay so with that on behalf of Canary Labs and Invicta Energy uh, we would like to thank you once again for taking your time um, to attend this webinar we look forward to hearing from you again and please contact us uh, at the addresses that I'm going to show now. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Yes, like I say, you know, uh, do reach out to us using the addresses here. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. And so with that, we end this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you all. Have a great day and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.